Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we're going to talk about the ever-growing governmental infringement and restriction of fundamental religious beliefs and freedoms, and other freedoms as well. But first, we want to speak briefly with EWTN's Vice President of Programming and Production, Mr. Peter Gagnon, about some very special upcoming events. Peter, what do you have for us? Well, uh, we'll start off with um, this Saturday is, if we can believe it, the fifth anniversary of Mother's Passing. And so we're going to have some special programming to, to honor that and to remember her. So on Friday, the, uh, the Friars are going to do special Stations of the Cross. Um, that's at 2.30 in the afternoon Eastern Time. Mm -hmm. And those stations will incorporate reflections that Mother herself wrote. And then um, that, that evening, we're going to actually air the Rosary Vigil, which we, um, the event that aired before Mother's funeral mass. So we're going to re-air it for people who, who, you know, never didn't see it the first time or mm -hmm. for those who were mm -hmm. there present. So, and to help remember Mother as well. The next morning, the mass is going to be dedicated to Mother Angelica, our Friar's Mass, and the rosary that follows mass um, is going to also have reflections with, from Mother Angelica mm -hmm. that she did. And then later that evening, we're going to air um, the actual mass of Christian burial that um, Mother's funeral mass. So yeah. um, people uh, can remember Mother mother and uh, that way. Yeah. And then obviously next week, uh, the b biggest week, Holy Week for us, uh, lots and lots of special programming um, from, from here, from Washington, D.C., from the Holy Land, from Rome. So mm -hmm. some of the things we want to highlight, we do have some new, uh, there are special events. There's uh, on Holy Thursday, there's an event, uh, Praying with Jesus in the Garden of Olives, which is a beautiful event. Um, yeah. And that's going to air on Holy Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Will that be something we've done, or will it be joining the friars in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane? It, it, it's the friars there, so they, oh, they yeah, a it's a live event. Ser it's yeah. actually a live event. That, uh, uh, I've been able to participate. Oh, you have? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, really it's, pretty. So It is superb. Yeah. And then on, on, on Good Friday, we actually have um, three new programs. One is called The Last Days with uh, Jonathan Rumi, who's in The Chosen. He plays Jesus. This is a, a stage production looking at the last days of Christ, and that's going to air Good Friday in the morning at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then we have a new um, Way of the Cross with reflections by Archbishop uh, Ganschwein, who's uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict's uh, personal secretary. He wrote mm -hmm. reflections for that. And so that'll air um, Friday afternoon, Good Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. And then we have a whole new um, reflections on the seven last words of Christ with Father Raymond D'Souza. And he actually incorporated um, St. Joseph into it, with being the year of St. Joseph. Sure. Though. So look for those on Friday at um, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And then we are going to have the traditional events from Rome, the Easter Vigil Mass with the Holy Father on Holy Saturday, and then on Easter Sunday, the, uh, the Mass of Easter. So uh, people should go to EWTN.com forward slash Holy Week that will give a full lineup of all the specials, live events, special programming, and that's good for all the people in different regions And so you'll see what time events sure. air in your region. So uh, just a, a very important week for EWTN. Yeah, uh, this, up. this is uh, the most important week of the year for Christians mm -hmm. to celebrate this Holy Week and the suffering, the death and resurrection of our Savior. Mm -hmm. This is key for we want to be able to do so. Uh, and we'll be blessed to be able to include people who can't get to church still exactly. in some areas. Exactly. Um, churches are still quite limited and closed yeah. even. Yeah, so there are so lots of special events, special programming, and, and all the liturgical events throughout the world so people can yeah. really um, join in and, and prayerfully live Holy Week. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank All you. It's right, good you stuff coming up. Yeah. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us.
All right, welcome back. Our guest tonight has worked for years to defend religious freedom in the United States and around the world. He also wants all of us to understand what is happening to our religious and personal freedoms. And he wants to motivate all of us to do everything we can to hold on to these unalienable rights. So please welcome the past Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus and the author of a new book called These Liberties We Hold Sacred, which are essays on faith and citizenship in the 20th century. Please welcome Mr. Carl Anderson. Carl, welcome. Thanks very much, Father. Great to be with you again. Good to have you. Good to have you. Yes. And thank you for this book. This is basically a collection of essays and talks, lectures that you've given, uh, I guess mostly during the time you were Supreme Knight. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So over the 20 years I was Supreme Knight, these are some of my, I hope, best speeches and yeah. some congressional testimony. Is that okay? And why did you center on this theme? Um, uh, you, you have a quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson in your title, These Liberties We Hold Sacred. Um, why did you focus on that? Well, because it, it seems to me it's the central issue we're confronted with today in the United States. Of course, Jefferson's statement uh, was, uh, can the liberties of a nation be secure if we have removed their only firm foundation, the belief in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gifts of God, mm -hmm. right? They're not the rights of man given to him by himself or by government. Mm -hmm. They are, as the Declaration of Independence said, we are endowed by our Creator with certain rights. And so, uh, it's a very natural law assessment, both in the, the uh, Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, it follows then what the framers did. They chose the free exercise of religion as the most important right, the first right in the Bill of Rights before freedom of assembly or of the press or of speech, uh, before uh, you know, the right to counsel or to be uh, safe from unreasonable searches. Uh, you might think that uh, having just fought a bloody war for independence, uh, where there would not have been a Concord or a Lexington or a Bunker Hill without an armed citizenry, they might have taken the Second Amendment and made that the First Amendment, the right to bear arms. But no, they chose the free exercise of religion. And uh, there was a consensus. Right, we had deists like Thomas Jefferson, but you also had a very devout Protestants and a Catholic who believed, who understood that morality and the importance of religion to supporting morality and how important public morality was for the uh, survival, the sustainability of democratic institutions. So whether you have uh, George Washington speaking about the necessity of religion to support morality, or John Adams saying the Constitution is written and depends on a moral and religious people for its sustainability. Uh, there was this consensus, whether you were a deist, as I say, or a Protestant or a Catholic, regarding the importance of religion in American life. And I think that's uh, the great uh, aspect of American exceptionalism. And we have to we have to work hard to preserve that. Yeah, I think uh, this is a uh, very important point. Uh, freedom of religion came before in in the, the the writing of the Constitution. It is stated before freedom of speech and assembly and press. You would think that freedom of press is the first freedom or freedom of speech, but it's not. It's freedom of religion. And part of the, the, the issue is that religion is where the individual 
deals inside his or her conscience with the meaning of life. This is where you confront God's existence and make the most basic decisions about your purpose in life and that you need to have total freedom to be able to do that, to live that choice. And, and that's a very important element. And I think the framers understood that this was not only a matter of freedom to worship, right? right? As the Lord says, Bingo. you can pray in your closet, right? But to be able to live your life based on your convictions, which you might say the American War of Independence was all about, they understood that conscience it's there that you grapple with the ultimate questions, and it is there that you define yourself as a person. And uh, you also have to be able to live that authentically. Uh, otherwise, it makes no sense to be forced to live a life that is constantly in conflict with your fundamental and basic values. That's what the framers wanted to protect us against. And they understood it not as, I say, as Jefferson said, a gift uh, from government, but a gift from God. This is uh, a, an important distinction between freedom of worship and freedom of religion. The, I think it was the Fourth French Republic put freedom of worship in their constitution. And so did the Soviet Union when they came up with their constitution after the Bolshevik Revolution. But what they meant is that you have to limit your worship to your home or inside the church. And then both governments, the French uh, Republic, expelled religious orders from France, and the Soviets executed uh, people, uh, both uh, cler especially clergy and religious, nuns and monks and priests, but also millions, tens of millions of lay people were martyred because they only meant you could worship inside your in very private ways. And freedom of religion is much greater than that. And that's what uh, sometimes, even when we hear our politicians, former President Obama would speak of freedom of worship. That was not constitutional. It's freedom of religion that is at stake. Well, it's the great totalitarian impulse, which we see beginning in the French Revolution and moving forward uh, through the 20th century and now still has its adherence. Nothing outside the state nothing against the state, everything within the state. So as long as your religion uh, is not outside the state or against the state, it's pretty compatible with whether they're Nazis or communists or fascists. And that's why uh, some organizations like the Knights of Columbus in the 1950s were so strong in promoting uh, the inclusion under God into the Pledge of Allegiance, because that shows we don't have an absolute government. Uh, the, it is subordinate to something else. And being a nation under God means you must respect conscience and therefore the priority of the free exercise of religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it was the Knights of Columbus uh, working with Congressman Rabot of Ohio, whose son, by the way, was a Jesuit I lived with. Uh, hmm. In Detroit, wow. yeah, uh, Dermot Matt Rabot was his son, Father Rabot, and um, he was very proud of his father's role with the Knights in having uh, under God introduced, and it's consistent with our Constitution, but we also see that there are conflicts, that, uh, one of the uh, ongoing conflicts, and may be revived uh, soon, is even when the Little Sisters of the Poor, a celibate, chaste community of nuns who take care of the 
indigent elderly are being required to pay for abortion and birth control, um, not because they expect the nuns to have abortions or use birth control, but it's a way to show that the state can take away these rights and impose state morality on Catholics. And I think that's what's at stake in that. And this is a good example of infringement of religious freedom. Well, it goes back to nothing outside the state, yep. right? The state is the ultimate moral arbiter of our lives. And that's never been the American tradition. It certainly has never been the Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think as citizens, we need to resist that kind of thinking. And as Catholics, we have to witness to the great value that our faith has in American culture. Uh, I think that was Father McGivney's great insight with forming an organization, the Knights of Columbus, based on the ideas of charity, unity, and brotherhood, that uh, we're not going to retreat into a ghetto like some religious and ethnic um, communities did. Uh, we're going to go out into society. We're going to claim our right to the free exercise of religion, and we're going to provide value to society. And um, exactly. through charity and other other kinds of works, and I think that's what the church has done historically throughout the United States history. And and this is a, a, a tension that you know the church has had, and persecution of Catholics goes to the earliest days of colonization, and. Even as great as Thomas Jefferson was, uh, in one of his letters, he wanted to keep the Jesuits out of the country after they were reconstituted, um, after our suppression. And he said, but our Constitution doesn't allow it. But he seemed to regret that. <laughs> but he, he obeyed the principles and let us in. But that anti-Catholicism kept a, a presence into the to the, the present moment. We certainly saw with the confirmation of some of the judge candidates over the past few years that their Catholicism, or as one Senator Feinstein said, your doctrine sounds loudly. And one uh, judge candidate who was a knight was questioned on that, that this anti-Catholicism is not from an evangelical or Protestant perspective, but now it's from a secular perspective. And it, re but it remains a constant from the colonial days. Well, it, re it really is a constant from the first century, if we could say, uh, <laughs> from the time of Christ, right? Uh, so it, it, uh, the church perennially, and Catholics, Christians perennially uh, confront this. The real question is that uh, it, the cultural forms of it change over time. So in the 19th century, you're dealing with the Protestant uh, uh, problem. Now we're dealing with the uh, totalitarian problem in the 20th century. Now we've got a sort of uh, socialism, secularism that uh, is looking at it in a slightly different cultural form. The, the, the difficulty is that these forms are presented in an appealing way, in a, in a temp, their a temptation, right? So they have to be appealing, they're tempting. And um, uh, we have to understand that. We have to understand that that uh, anti-Catholicism will appeal to certain people because it is a temptation to them. And it appeals to a lot of Catholics who, who don't want to stay in a Catholic ghetto, but become willing to go along in order to get along with the trends of society. And we, we see that those who have various political aspirations sometimes go along with party platforms that are contrary to our morals and faith.
and they go along with business practices that are contrary to morals and faith. Yeah. And it's not only politics, it's in business, it's in entertainment and a wide variety of other realms. And this is where the Knights, I think, are calling people to keep the balance of strong Catholic commitment and strong commitment to the American founding, the Declaration and the Constitution, and true patriotism, not watering down either American values or Catholic values. Well, it's certainly a very complex problem. Um, and I think it needs to be thought through from the standpoint of evangelization. It's not simply the articulation of church teaching, although church teaching has to be articulated in a, a way that can resonate in a contemporary society, in a contemporary context. Um, you look at uh, St. John Paul II, that was the whole point of his writings, such as uh, Love and Responsibility, his plays, his poetry, his theology of the body. How do we present the perennial teaching of the church in a way that's relevant to contemporary um, citizens and believers. So we have to do that. But how do we actually evangelize people so that their faith, their personal relationship with the Lord actually affects and gives them the strength and courage to, with, to withstand this, to resist it? Mm -hmm. And uh, in many areas, um, we have not been all that successful. So yeah. maybe it's time for a rethinking. Uh, you mentioned uh, question in politics. I mean, uh, if you take the pro-life issue, now we're coming up on 50 years with Roe v. Wade. And uh, we haven't been very successful in convincing a whole number of, uh, let's admit it, Catholic politicians. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to get something you haven't had before, you have to uh, do something you haven't done before. I think a wise man once said that. So we need to rethink our engagement with uh, leaders of government, leaders of industry, mm -hmm. leaders of business, mm -hmm. uh, leaders in entertainment, because so far that engagement over the last half century hasn't produced uh, a great deal of results. And uh, the, the other consequence, of course, is uh, as an example, if you cannot convince Catholic politicians on the church's teaching on pro-life, why would you expect Protestant government officials to listen to the church's teaching on immigration or the death penalty or a whole host of other mm -hmm. uh, issues? So there's, there's a continuity yep. here. There's maybe you might say a seamless garment in terms of the wide spectrum of, of engagement in public issues, but the church is called to do that. It's called to do it in a prophetic way. And I think if uh, we're realistic, we need to be creative and find ways that actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. These are some of the issues that you address in this book and that you're trying to, you know, bring up what the issues are, what the values are, but you also want Catholics to take action. You know, you want Catholics to be able to uh, re respond and come up with strategies. Where would some of the key issues be that you'd like to see Catholics start to act, and what do you see that they can do? Well, part of the book deals with the question of persecution of Christians in Iraq uh, yes. with ISIS. And there's a section there that I go into some detail that the testimony I presented to Congress on several occasions and the, the way we worked with both Republicans and Democrats in the House. We worked with the Obama administration. We worked with the Trump mm -hmm. administration mm -hmm. to, to actually engage the government, change law, change the way the laws are administered to help these people. So Catholics, I think, are called to do that in the first instance. 
Uh, there, there, there's also a section in the book where I, I talk about Dr. Martin Luther King as an example of a Christian who, uh, on Christian principles, uh, establishes a social movement that actually changes the culture, changes society, and not simply by pol political action, although that's important, but by a frame of reference that puts out Christian values. He could have he could have talked about violence. He could, there was certainly violence in, in the civil rights movement on both sides for a while. You look at Malcolm X, uh, et cetera. Um, but no, King was talking about a Christian approach, a peaceful approach, uh, a brotherly approach where you loved your enemies. It, he said clearly, it doesn't mean I like everything they do. <laughs> in fact, he disliked a lot of what people were doing. But he had a Christian uh perspective and a Christian approach. And so I think that's a model for us going forward. We're called to build a culture of life. We're called to, to help create a civilization of love. And you must do that on Christian principles. That's why I was always so inspired by Knights of Columbus, charity, unity, and brotherhood. And when you lose those kinds of values in society, you see what we're, we're finding uh, throughout the past year, violence, yeah. the division, uh, social unrest, uh, communities falling apart, uh, uh, neighbors at each other's throats. Um, we're called to make a witness to overcome that. And um, that's been historically the purpose and the, the mission of Christians, especially the laity. In one sense, uh, some of the material you present on Dr. King shows that he kept both the ideals of the American founding and the rights that the American uh, founders recognized belong to everybody, even when the founders themselves didn't take the great step of ending slavery, they still had the values and uh, of, you know, freedom as being unalienable. And he, Martin Luther King Jr. understood those American values, but he also understood them in the light of his Christianity and that his Christian commitment and his commitment to American ideals gave him expression of, you know, most famously that, you know, we don't want to judge people on the basis of the color of their skin, but on the content of their character, you know, and that he could make that and work, uh, absorb a lot of violence. You know, we live, I live here in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I'm friends with folks who were part of the early civil rights movement uh, including a close friend of mine who was inside 16th Street Baptist when the Ku Klux Klan bombed it. He survived the bombing, obviously. Um, but, you know, these are uh, an absorption of pain and suffering that, as you say, transformed American society. Not that everything is perfect. But that was a major transformation. He combined that. And this is where the Knights of Columbus embody the same combination of values of what it means to be a Catholic and what it means to be an American. And that's a very important set of combina uh, combinations. Well, I think, you know, certainly Dr. King understood better than most Americans that the promise of the Declaration of Independence uh, and the Bill of Rights had not been kept. Right. And it was time to make good on that promise. But I think also his Christian uh, perspective, he understood that no society is perfect. And so the answer isn't to cancel out the past. That's a revolutionary, secular I would argue, totalitarian approach. The Christian approach is to build on what's good for the future. And therefore, I think that's the way forward for us, not to recognize that our that the founders were perfect, right. uh, just like we're not perfect today, right? The, those without sin <laughs> can cast the first stone. We have too many people throwing rocks today because 
they believe they are without sin, right? And there's uh, a few of them that will be taking those rocks and bashing their own heads. But that's another <laughs> problem. We need to um, take a little break, but I want to pick up on this when we get back from the break, because I think this is a, a, a key element of the present moment in American history. Uh, so if you'll stay with us and ask all of our audience to stay with so that we can um, very much continue on this part of the conversation. All right, we are back with Carl Anderson, who is a former Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, and we're discussing his book, These Liberties We Hold Sacred, Essays on Faith and Citizenship in the 21st Century. It's by Carl Addis, uh, Anderson. It is available at EWTNRC.com. And it is item number 7546, 7546. Um, good read for the present situation we're in uh, in, in America and other countries too, but we'll focus on the United States. Now, Carl, we, we're starting to talk about this need to uh, uh, deal with the difference of someone like Martin Luther King Jr., who knew that these values of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights were important and necessary, and that he approached including uh, African Americans and all people of color in those essential rights that come from God. And he did that because he knew they came from God and he was a Christian committed to his faith, not only in terms of the ideas, but also the way he lived out the in, uh, promotion of these values. Now, what at this present time, we see relativism coming into play and uh, where people don't hold to any particular truth, including the Constitution and the Declaration. And there's a lot more tension and violence. You've brought up the violence in, in our society uh, because there aren't such clear values in the minds of those trying to make change. The more anarchical, they want anarchy instead of order. Uh, and how do we deal with this present situation, given the values that you're describing in your book? Well, I think one point of departure is to look at uh, what Pope Benedict uh, said often when he referred to the dictatorship of relativism. Yes. Uh, the, the, one of the difficulties is, is if, if there is no truth, right? There is no falsehood. And if there is no falsehood, then there is not anything uh, that we could describe as a lie. So yeah. reference that now in terms of our political discourse, in terms of the secular media, much of the secular media. Um, there's no longer a reference to reality as being the truth it becomes a use of language to assume greater power or the use of power to assume the superiority of your language versus somebody else's language. So there isn't an emphasis on critical thinking. There's an emphasis on political correct correctness. So it changes the whole dynamic of public discourse. Right. And I think as Christians, we have to be aware of that. It's almost 
going back to uh, Socrates and the problem with the sophists. Uh, the sophists weren't ignorant or they weren't uh, uh, not intelligent. They had made an art form of arguing any side of a question mm -hmm. uh, with equal conviction. And Socrates said, well, you're missing the point because you're not focusing on the ultimate questions of life. Right. Uh, we have we have that occurring today. So uh, we go back to what Paul Pope Paul the Sixth said: If people listen today to arguments, it's because or listen to teachers, it's because they are also witnesses. So you can see in somebody's life the authenticness of what they're saying. This is the lesson of the early church. Look at those Christians. You can tell they're Christians by how they love each other how they act. Um, and so we have to have legitimate arguments. We have to have uh, convincing argumentation, but it's not enough to just stand on a soapbox. We have to live lives which in themselves are convincing. And for that, you don't need a PhD. You need yeah. faith. You need courage. Yeah. A little bit of walking around sense, as we say down here in Alabama, uh, it's, that's useful too. Um, but one of the things that I, I, you, you mentioned, that in a world where there is no such thing as truth, there are no lies. On the other hand, when I listen to the discourse that goes on in, say, the news media and among politicians, anybody who disagrees with me is a liar. That then, when there is no truth, these folks make lies ubiquitous. Everybody is lying who disagrees with my perspective. And it's not just that they might be mistaken, but people don't make a distinction between not knowing all the facts, which is part of ignorance, that's part of the human condition, versus those who willfully know the truth and either don't say it or change the truth into something other. And this is one of the difficulties, because then if everybody who disagrees with me is a liar, then they are necessarily immoral for disagreeing with me. Yeah, yeah. When at the same time, I'm saying there is no such thing as absolute truth, except what I hold. This is a, a very twisted situation our culture has gotten itself into. And it's a no-win situation that it sets up that you cannot come out ahead except to conform to the ideology of whoever has the most power. Uh, in, in, a, in a relativistic world, might makes you right, and that's all you've got. Whereas in our perspective as Christians, we believe in truth. I mean, today's gospel, our Savior Jesus says, remain in my word and you will become my disciples, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, and he means freedom from sin. And that is our perspective from Christ about truth. But the culture doesn't accept that and therefore doesn't accept the, the basic rights of the Bill of Rights or of the Declaration. Well, uh, it's hard to... Uh... Look, there's a certain in, in, incongruence in, in the way uh, the secular political discourse is occurring today. Mm -hmm. uh, you might look at it as a form of heresy that takes concepts of virtue, that takes concepts of truth, that take concepts of conscience, twist them, and you end up very close to Robespierre, what you were saying, right? That if you disagree... Exactly. 
you're lying. If you're lying, you're evil. If you're evil, then you need to be destroyed. Yeah. And so politics becomes what we're seeing today in Washington. Politics is no longer a discussion uh, in order to find a consensus, in order to build a way forward to solve a problem. Politics often, at least my perception of it, mm -hmm. watching it in the news media, is trying to destroy one's opponent so that instead of compromising and moving forward gradually, which is sort of the American democratic uh, heritage, uh, we want to destroy opposition and therefore be able to impose 100% of our view. Yes. That's, that's not democracy as much as it is a totalitarian approach to winner take all. Yeah. And um, uh, I think that's part, again, of the role that, that Christians bring to the public discourse. And uh, we see it where Christians have made important uh, contributions. And they, when they have not been afraid to um, cite the great thinkers in our tradition, for example, again, going back to Martin Luther King, his letter from the Birmingham jail, who does he cite? He cites, um, he cites uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, he cites uh, St. Augustine for his, um, his, his um, authorities. His authorities, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, Dr. King uh, was uh, had a doctorate in theology, and he was aware of the great thinkers and the the process of reasoning, as well as having the basic instinct of human freedom is a gift from God. That you and dignity, because that was it was not only the uh, freedom. I mean, there were no more slaves as such, but the dignity of African Americans was constantly being attacked. And in those days, with segregation and lots of uh, Jim Crow laws, these were horrible things that were oftentimes enforced by the Ku Klux Klan. And today we see, instead of people in white sheets and hoods, now we have folks with black clothes and black hoods causing mischief and violence on the streets the way the Klan did. But it's still this use of force and violence and not any kind of principled approach to understanding how we raise everybody's dignity rather than dividing into you know groups that I like right now and groups which I may not like later on they can that, that with in a world that is relativistic the groups you presently favor may change and by setting them up as groups you also are setting up future conflicts if African-American rights are favored over other people's rights, how will they fare against Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, Pacific Island Americans? And you set up that there will be future ongoing conflicts with these small groups because you see groups rather than Americans who have these key values and uh, given by God to each and every one of them. And this is a very important tension that we have right now. Well, I served for 10 years on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and so I saw a lot of what you're, you're saying uh, in terms of the, you might say, rivalry among different racial or ethnic uh, communities, mm -hmm. uh, which continue today. And that's part of the reason why uh, I think the message of Our Lady of Guadalupe is so important, because there you had, uh, at her appearance, the 
greatest, one of the greatest clashes of civilizations, you might also say clashes of races mm -hmm. in human history. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a country very much in devastation. In fact, the Bishop of Mexico at the time wrote to uh, uh, the emperor, and he said, if, if God, the, the situation is so bad here, that if God does not intervene directly, I fear all may be lost. And of course, in a few years, he did with the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And what was her message? It was a message of hope, of reconciliation. She didn't come as a European. She did not speak to one of the European missionaries. She came as an indigenous. She spoke an indigenous language to an indigenous and made a tremendous, tremendous difference. And I think that difference is what we need again today. Mm -hmm. A message of brotherhood, a message of reconciliation, a message of hope, a message of peace. So the church is called to bring, and it's what we're called as Catholics to bring to each other. And I think that's how we begin to move out of the impasse. Uh, going back to the civil rights movement, I mean, uh, you look at the 1950s, uh, we had just won two world wars with a segregated military. Uh, the South had bought into uh, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, and then with Jim Crow laws, uh, had undone what it had agreed to, right? Uh, that had been upheld by the Supreme Court, separate and equal, That's right? right? Uh, which everybody knew was false. Everybody knew that the, the, the separation was based on the fact that they weren't considered equal. And yet, by the 1950s, that was there were a few cracks in that edifice, but it was very, very strong. Mm -hmm. So even though we see a, a, what we might call a societal consensus, on a great moral evil, it doesn't mean that a committed, courageous minority cannot change that. That's what happened in the 50s and 60s. It can happen again. So even though uh, we may look at all the difficulties uh, that we're confronted today, and there are many, and they're global, uh, authentic Christian witness, courageous witness, um, can make it can make a huge difference, uh, and an individual commitment can make a huge difference. I mean, I think you think of Mother Teresa; um, she did not sit there writing essays about the necessity to go to the periphery to help the poor. She went to the periphery to help the poor, and look at the difference she made. We need people that encourage us to do those things, but we also need the people to go out and do them. And it's in the doing that we change the things. And I, again, that's why I was so edified for 20 years leading the Knights of Columbus, because we saw every every day on thousands of different ways uh, our council's doing that. And I hope that's part of uh, what we see in the year of St. Joseph. I mean, there ought to be a reflection, and, and Pope Francis, we should be very grateful to him for declaring this year the year of St. Joseph. But we might begin with the reflection, why did the Lord choose a carpenter to be the earthly father of his son? Why a carpenter? Uh, it could have been a fisherman, could have been a Levite, could have been a rabbi, a lot of different choices in that tradition that would have made sense. Why a carpenter? I think it's because carpenters actually go out and do stuff they build things. They get the job done. And um, that's what we need. We need men. That's why I like the Knights of Columbus. They go out and do things. See a problem, fix the problem. They don't leave their family in the cold. They build a house. And um, we need men like that. And we need men that understand that, uh, uh, again, to go back to pro-life, that uh, when they have children, the Lord is doing what he did to St. Joseph. These are not, this is not yours. This is mine, but I'm entrusting you with their care. 
right? I have children, but they're not my children. They have a different destiny. I'm entrusted with their care. And we need, we need to recover a really deep sense of what it means to be a disciple. Yeah, I, a disciple. I, I don't know if you've been to Nazareth uh, in the Holy Land. Yeah, and yes. if you know just across the ridge that is just north of Nazareth, about a mile and a half or two away, was a town that had been devastated by zealot rebels. And it was, that town was rebuilt during the boyhood of Christ, most likely by people like St. Joseph, who were working to rebuild hmm. the whole town. And, and then it was rebuilt. It was the provincial capital of Galilee. And so, you know, you see something like that and individuals who make that kind of difference versus, you know, I, I also like to contrast how three times the Supreme Court has attacked human dignity in Dred Scott, and it was a Catholic Supreme Court justice that wrote the decision saying that blacks were inferior and that instigated the Civil War. And then Plessy versus Ferguson, the separate but yeah. equal, and then Roe versus Wade. And we have to be willing to be those folks who, as, and it was Christians, who primarily led the uh, opposition to slavery and then later on to segregation and now to pro-life. We have to be those folks that build like St. Joseph what other people would wreck and be the folks that are these builders. I'm afraid though, we have flat run out of time. I wanna thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. And again, encourage our folks to get this book. It's called These Liberties We Hold Sacred, Essays on Faith and Citizenship in the 21st Century by Carl Anderson. Get it at EWTNRC.com, where it is item 7546. Thank you, Carl, for being with us tonight. Appreciate it very much. And I want to give you and our audience my blessing. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you Carl, plus all the coming Easter and Holy Week specials, only because this network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And then we will be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you.